Hi, I'm Kirstie Allison Ampey. I'm chair of the Arlington School Committee, and I call this meeting of the regular school committee on Thursday, November 16th, 2023, um, to order. We are here in the new wing of the high school, which Dr. Homo will mention in a couple minutes. And before we do that, I want to note the um, passing of the very successful passing of the override last week um, for which we thank both the voters and the taxpayers of Arlington. Uh, it was resoundingly positive with a 61.4 percent yes uh, in favor and given that the commitments of the override included significant increases in funding to the schools to both fund our strategic plan and to uh, one of the components of which is increasing compensation for educators. Uh, we are both very thankful and just impressed that the town um, was so understanding of both our needs and appreciative of our efforts. So. Uh, I want to say thank you for that. And then we had another big milestone last week, the yeah. day after. So I'll actually start by commenting for just a second on the override. We're really looking forward to implementing the strategic plan that we've worked so hard on, and these dollars let us do that. Um, we're really grateful for the show of faith and the tireless work that our educators put in every single day um, for Arlington's children. And we're, we just want to thank the work of the volunteers and elected officials who made this possible because now we get to go do the fun stuff and we get to do the fun stuff in beautiful new buildings um, and the uh, educational plan for the new Arlington High School really wouldn't be possible without the override dollars uh, because the strategic plan is very aligned to making sure that we can do more deeper learning uh, in facilities that allow for interdisciplinary work and allow for a lot of collaboration among adults. We are sitting in a brand new school committee room. Um, Central office has been steadfastly focused on moving for the past several weeks. Um, and we've managed to do so successfully in the middle of a school year along with all of our high school students doing the same. So it is a beautiful new building. We're really looking forward to welcoming members of the community to do tours later on this um, winter and spring. And it's we had conferences in the building almost immediately upon opening it up and it was wonderful to see parents coming in to talk with their teachers. Our staff, our students watching them walk in for the first time was just such a treat because they were <coughs> elated to be in such a bright, welcoming new space. Um, so we're grateful so much to the taxpayers of Arlington for continuing to prioritize the needs of our students and to allow us to move forward with some of the innovative and exciting work that we're doing. Thank you. Um, so there is no public comment. So I can't, so you may have, the people who are here and maybe some of you on Zoom had seen that this is all kind of jury rigged and we were, we're still a work in progress here. Um, there will be changes over time. We'll be talking about it later in the facilities uh, report. But in the meantime, I can't move my mic any closer. <laughs> so uh, if, I, if you can't hear me, someone needs to wave. Okay, they say I'm fine, but I know sometimes that's a problem. So there is no public comment. We do have an AHS AHS representative who I see on Zoom, Graham Minnick, do, do you want to give us a report? Um, there's not much going on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the move's been pretty good so far. Um, yeah, everyone's happy. Uh, it's nice and clean. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I guess it. Okay. Thank you. Um, Next, we have the Pierce Improvement Plan. Uh, with, do you want to introduce? Um, yes. While our Pierce team is coming up and getting settled, we're going to have you all over here, and we're going to hope to have your slides up here. Okay. We're working on that. Um, I just want to say Pierce saw some absolutely spectacular outcomes for students uh, this year. They really have been doing a lot of hard work over the last several years. Um, to improve instruction, interventions, build out an uh, instructional leadership team. And I really always enjoy heading over to Pierce and seeing bright pink flamingos everywhere. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing what they've been up to and what they're planning for this year. Are we good to go or no? No? It just cut off. All right. <laughs> well, 
maybe we'll have slides. Otherwise, I'm sure you'll be able to follow along with an exceptionally well-executed presentation. Um, no pressure. So <laughs> I'll hand it off to you all. I am driving the slides. Can you see them okay-ish? Okay. I at least need my screen to be working. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. Let's twist it a yeah, little bit if little that's bit. not working. That looks great. Thank yeah. You. Well, if, they, if it can be here, that's great. But if not, this works fine too. Yeah. Not All right. Sure. Yeah. Take it away. I, yeah, I think so. The, the, our okay. viewing audience at home can see. All right, no sweat. <laughs> Thank you, school committee, for um, having us in this evening. We are very excited uh, to share our plan with you. But before we do, um, we'll introduce ourselves, and then we'll dive right in. Um, thank you for having me. I'm Andrew Amadi, and I'm the proud principal. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Julia McEwen. I'm the assistant principal at Pierce. Hi, everyone. Steph McKenna, math coach at Pierce. Hi, everybody. I'm Beth Ledoux, the literacy coach at Pierce. <coughs> So briefly, uh, this evening we'll give you um, some data overviews. We'll talk briefly about some of the wins that we see um, in the last school year. We'll talk about some of the challenges we, we face as a school. Um, we'll share our school goals with you um, and some of the ways that we plan to achieve them and some of the resources that we um, feel may be helpful. And um, as always, look forward to your uh, questions this evening. All right, so um, we are the Pierce School. We are very excited to be here. Um, we have uh, 336 students. We have about 50 staff members. Um, we are uh, proud and fortunate to be part of the METCO uh, program, and we have a wonderful learning community in our, um, of students in our language-based learning uh, program. Uh, we currently have 17 sections in the school, and um, we, like I said before, are very excited uh, to present to you more this evening. So the data that we wanted to share with you this evening is around our absenteeism, um, our achievement and growth specifically in ELA and math um, as shown in the um, spring MCAS, our Dibbles data, and then our panorama data around climate and culture. All right, so the, the first thing um, we wanted to bring to your attention this evening is our um, data on chronic absenteeism. Um, this is an area where we made some gains as a school. Um, we reduced the, uh, we were able to over, overall reduce the number of students that were chronically absent, and we made um, some pretty significant gains in, in our high needs uh, subcategories as well as um, students that fall in the low income categories, uh, cat subcategory. Um, we see some positive signals uh, w within this data. It's trending the way we want it to, and we're seeing some. Um, um, some positivity. Um, some of the things we did last year that I think were impactful were partnering with families, regularly communicating with families, meeting with families, and understanding some of the needs and barriers to getting um, to school. Um, and, and I look forward to keeping some of those um, in place this year and expanding the ways that we're supporting our families. But I also want to be upfront that um, it's, it still remains alarming. Uh, to me that one in five uh, students that are in a low income category um, are still um, chronically absent. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that as we get into some of the academic achievement data, um, but that is a, a, a main area of focus this year. And I'm gonna to talk to you guys about the achievement and growth data for the ELA component. So as you can see, as Andrew said with his last slide, we've seen upward trends in every category between 2022 and 2023, but probably the most exciting is um, our largest growth was in the high need subcategory, and you can see that in the last two indicators. That's where we made tons of growth, something we're really proud of. But what's not shown in this chart, which is very exciting, are a couple of very specific grade level examples. So in our third grade, 77% of our students were meeting or exceeding state standards, which meant our third grade students were ranked in the 96th percentile in the state, which is amazing. Our fifth graders last year had an overall SGP or student growth percentile of 57, which is a really strong indicator of years to come, especially our fourth graders now moving up to fifth. A couple of things that we're trying new or um, sort of adding on this year that's gonna 
keep contributing to this upward trend is we have stretched out the grade bands of using the Dibble screener. In the past, we've only done K to three, and this year we're doing K to five. And the Dibble screener, it measures phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and reading comprehension, and it's given between two to three times a year. And what we're doing with this data is actually pretty incredible. We're meeting as teams after these benchmarks. We're analyzing the data. We're noticing trends. And we're having it really inform our teaching. And whether it's extension work or intervention work, we're also incorporating a stronger language arts program. And it's all based on the science of reading. And lastly, we just have amazingly talented ELA educators. And that's why we have such high expectations and such high achievement. Um, <clears throat> so similar to the, the ELA data, we saw overall gains across the board um, that were really encouraging this year in mathematics, um, according to the MCAS. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but most um, exciting, I think, is um, are the gains that we can see there made by some students in our more vulnerable uh, categories. Um, you can see there. Um, some things that you can't see looking at the data, um, our fifth grade uh, <coughs> charged, uh, charged an SGP of 73, which is incredibly difficult to do. Um, and uh, something else I'd like to point out is the work of K-2 that, that leads to some of these, um, these data points that we get to see in MCAS later on. Um, our K-2 teams have been working year after year um, helping to improve our fluency screeners, which it's so nice to have a common data set at K to two that we can then work, we can use um, setting them up for three to five. Um, and those fluency screeners now extend into grades three and four as well. So we have more data we can use in our ACE meetings um, among teachers. Um, uh, thank you. I'm just going to say one more thing about math. Um, and before I do, though, I want to double down on a statement that both um, Beth and Steph shared, which is that. Um, we have an outstanding staff and a really hardworking staff, and we are aligned K to five. And so some of this, the wins we're seeing tonight are in the upper grades in terms of the data, but they are a reflection of all mm -hmm. of our educators, and I'm very proud of what they, what they do. Um, one of the concerns that um, you're not seeing on this graph in math, though, um, is around some of our um, racial subgroup uh, category, uh, categories, um, and, and there's some... Um, a couple things that stand out as areas that we uh, will continue to focus on. One of them being that um, only one in 12 uh, students that are black met or exceeded uh, expectations in mathematics. And that is deeply problematic. And that is something that our team remains focused on, um, uh, on improving and committing to over the years. Um, additionally, um, seven of 18 students that identify as Hispanic or Latino met or exceeded expectations and mathematics, which is um, also uh, below where we would like to be uh, in terms of supporting and um, addressing the needs of all of our students. Thank you. So as you know, we only test um, the science MCAS doesn't exist for grades three and four, but it does for grade five. And um, as you can see here, we did quite well, and we scored in the 90th percentile for the state, which we're very proud of. But one of the things, again, that the data doesn't show is um, the qualitative information that we have around science at Pierce, which is that this is one of our students across the board, K to five, favorite subjects. Um, we know this from talking to them, from listening to them in the hallways, from having informal conversations with them, but also through the empathy interviews <coughs> that were done towards the end of last school year, where consistently across the board, what's your favorite subject, science? What's your favorite subject, science? We have um, the classroom capacity for kids to be engaged in hands-on experiences with science. Um, and it, I think that it is really showing up at this fifth grade MCAS level. So that's another point that we're quite proud of and are going to be continuing to promote. All right, I'll speak uh, briefly about um, some of the trend, some of the trend areas that we see. So um, from 2022 to 2023, we saw um, a small gain with our non-high needs groups and, a, and an increase in students um, that are considered high needs. However, um, we have a lot of work to do to continue to close the gap. We also know that chronic absenteeism um, continues to impact our families that are in the high needs category, specifically in low income categories at the highest rate. So part of our working theory um, is that if we can continue to um, have high quality 
um, instruction and curriculum and we can get our students to school more frequently over the years we will continue to close this gap um, and as we go to the next slide <coughs> in math you're going to see something very similar and our um, theory remains true we need to get kids to school as much as we possibly can and then surround them with rich um, cognitive academic tasks and um, add in layers of support around interventions tutoring um, and um, increase access to after-school programming um, in order to close this gap. This one's me as well. Um, <laughs> all right, so this is um, the kind of, this is our Dibbles data. And briefly, what I see in this data is that um, at last year, uh, as compared to the district, our students exited kindergarten a little bit uh, behind on benchmark as compared to some of the other um, district schools and as we move through first grade um, we start to close that gap um, and have more students uh, at or above grade level by second grade um, we are about on par uh, and also have a higher percentage of students reading on grade level and by the time we get to third grade um, the vast majority of our students are reading at or above grade <coughs> level um, and our students that are um, in the well below category are um, are are still there and there are less students in that category and so this is something we see as trending in the right direction um, and that anytime there is a student though that is below or well below um, there is still work to do all right so we're switching gears here a little bit and talking about climate and culture so last year we really focused our instructional um, uh, plan about targeting students in, in sense of belonging and making sure that the, um, their school level experience um, was full of joy, that it was positive, and we made a number of adjustments within the school um, to commit to all of our students. Um, additionally, we focused on rigorous expectations in the classroom and um, high level um, interesting, engaging cognitive tasks. And what we saw in those two areas that we really focused on are two of the largest gains. Um, and in school safety, we, we saw um, a small gain as well as teacher and student relationships. And um, we saw school climate go down a touch. Um, and that is something we'll be looking into more this year. And lastly, um, with student uh, climate and culture, these are specific questions that were asked within um, the sense of belonging category. Um, and one of them um, that stands out to me um, is um, when you feel like giving up, how likely is it that your teacher will um, ask you to keep trying? And this is something that we talked about in some of our professional work last year. It's really supporting um, our, our students, you know, asking how we can continue to support them. And this is also something that our non-classroom teachers are, are doing too, to try to forge and build relationships across our school. And, and that's bearing out in the data. All right, and then we have one slide this evening, and this is um, what our staff um, told us. And I'm going to go back to my notes here because I have quite a bit of positive things to say. So as you can see, um, that we saw some pretty significant increases in um, our staff's sense of belonging and our sta staff sense of well-being. Um, to increase by 17 <coughs> points for a full staff, I think, speaks volumes about the, um, the, the professional staff that we have and their willingness um, to go the extra mile for one another. Um, from my perspective, I think that we used our professional time meaningfully. We committed to outings uh, together outside of the school. We focused on integrating teams and grade levels to create more connections across the school. And we, we created some flexibility, um, and, and I credit the co our coaches in creating some peer-to-peer walkthroughs that allowed us to get into one another's classes and learn from one another. And I'm very proud of the work that we've done over the last year on this. We asked the staff um, what they felt like contributed to this. And there's a lot of things, um, one being the additions of the new playground. So thank you to uh, folks on this committee and thank you to the folks across town that have made our outdoor facilities better. Um, to, there was a shout out to well-crafted class schedules with uh, wind blocks or what I need blocks. The establishment of the Flamingo community, school norms, a rebranding of our mascot, a commitment to free breakfast and lunch, um, an expansion of before and after school programming, um, a deep collaboration across all departments and grade levels was noted, as was um, strong teacher hires in the past three years. Um, and lastly, there are other things that happen in our school that are more informal, like 
book clubs, and spirit weeks. Um, and as I mentioned briefly, peer-to-peer -peer learning, which um, can be as informal as asking a, a colleague to be able to come in and watch them teach or vice versa, um, and just sharing um, something you learned from them. So I'm really proud of this, and that's what I've got for you. I'll pass it back to um, Julia. Before we move on to the next slide, one thing as a newcomer to Pierce that just listening again to some of the things that our staff shared that make them, um, that are reasons for those strong numbers and a sense of belonging and a sense of well-being, you might be thinking, you know, how does us having free breakfast and lunch for all kids, it's not really a staff thing, but one of the things that you hear up and down the hallways of Pierce is how proud our staff are of things like that for our students and how much their sense of belonging and sense of pride and joy around the school is really centered on the experience of students. And so coming in to Pierce this year, that, that just, I mean, it just jumps right up at you and it's something that I think is also very commendable about our staff is that their own sense of belonging and well-being is intricately tied to that of the students and the experience that the students are having in our school every day. So based on this information and the work that we're doing, um, there's a lot of words on here for our, in terms of our goals and I know that we're all good readers and close readers so I'm gonna depend on you for that. But what I really <coughs> wanted to pull out is the things that we're focusing on this year are really closing the achievement gap between the um, non-high needs and high needs students, specifically in literacy, and making use of high leverage instructional practices to do that um, so that we can continue to see that gap close and close and close as students move throughout the grades at Pierce. We also want to continue <coughs> to focus on student engagement, again, through the use of um, high leverage instructional practices, like the ones that we are seeing in our um, new EL curriculum that's in its pilot phase this year, but really thinking about what student engagement looks like, what we want to see students doing when, they're walk when we walk into a classroom, what teachers are asking students to do, and really <coughs> using that as um, our measure for what student engagement looks like and that's a constant conversation on our instructional leadership team as well. We also want to continue to improve that sense of belonging for all students and really dive into which students, which subcategories are maybe not showing such high numbers of, feeling of, of a feeling of belonging, of a sense of belonging and similarly for our, for our families really wanting to increase that sense of belonging for every single family that is connected to Pierce. All right, so some of the things we're, we're committing to uh, this year um, are key, um, using our professional time wisely, um, using our ACE time, our building times, um, to really focus on literacy instruction, uh, improving access to interventions, and um, learning to, with one another. We're committing to um, closing that gap that I spoke earlier about, about chronic absenteeism and making sure we can get students to school. Um, and there are a variety of measures uh, of ways that we're trying to do that this year. And we are um, going to continue to refine our peer observations that have been in place for two years and to really focus them on the student level experience around um, engagement um, and high level tasks in the classroom. And some of the resources um, that we feel uh, could be helpful, um, it's always nice to have more folks that are trained as reading specialists. Uh, this is an area that um, uh, is pretty nuanced and specialized and reading is a very difficult thing for some students to learn. So I am very impressed with the new uh, tier one resource and I also understand that we will continue to need to uh, support students that um, reading is challenging for and, and really want to make sure we're doing the best that we can for that, uh, for, for them. Um, Supporting some of our newcomer families, uh, particularly our, our MLL families that are new to Arlington, in some cases new to the United States, and making sure that they have what they need, uh, both at the school level but also outside of the school, is something that we are committed to um, and something that requires resources, uh, both at the school level and town level. And lastly, just uh, better connections to, to town resources. Um, before I say more about that, I'll say that I, I feel very fortunate to work here and also to live here, and we have uh, a lot of resources and some really dedicated folks around uh, different departments and just making sure we're, we're connecting uh, so that we can get students into um, athletics, um, food, making connections across town, um, and, and really making sure that all of our children um, uh, can experience all that there is uh, to have in Arlington. And that's what we have for you this evening. Great. Thank you very much. Um, 
Do you want to add anything or should I go straight to questions? Only that I'm an exceptionally proud superintendent this evening and this group has done an amazing work at Pierce. Um, any questions? Mr. Thingman. Thank you. That was, a, that was a great report. I'm curious, you talked about resources needed for students born outside of the United States and other, what, what, are you, what are you talking, what, what's the need? Well, some of the need is uh, making sure that, um, I mean, there, there, there's a lot. I mean, making sure that uh, anywhere from transportation, getting to school, um, uh, school functions, uh, getting uh, access to um, health care providers, um, getting linked up with community resources that are available. In some cases, we, we know that they, they, in some cases, we know that those are being connected to, and in other cases, we wonder. Um, if they are or not are not and so um, liaising more with the town more with folks um, to be able to get every family what they need yeah good okay thanks for that's nice of you to recognize that um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. your uh, subgroup analysis said that the scores for ELA and um, math grade three to five it I don't I I think you have you've, you've, you've had growth in um, High need students, and you've ac actually closed the achievement gap. So, and I, it, you know, and every school's done a good job too of working on that. On that, but you seem to have had a lot of success. And I'm wondering, I guess, this is a question for the district: to what extent is <clears throat> your experience, your practice, how you're doing things being shared with the rest of the district, or is it relevant at all? I guess it's a question for Liz. <clears throat> well, I'm writing your question down. Oh. <laughs> So um, the goal is definitely to share mm -hmm. the successful practices that lead to outcomes like this yep. with the district as a whole. Um, first, we have to define with the Pierce team what it is that happened that led like that to results like that. And so a lot of what we want to do this year is pay some really close attention in those places where we see a gap closing to what it is that led to that gap closure. because. One of the things that we know out, coming out of the pandemic is that we've had a series of different baselines set over the last several years. And I think this year we finally have the ability to compare apples to apples. And so the question now is, okay, we can compare apples from last year to apples from this year. What actually led to healthier apples this year? And, and what do we need to do to make sure that the entire orchard is growing that way. I'm sorry, I just really oh, wow. ran away with this metaphor. <laughs> um, How do you like them apples, Liz? But whatever the Pierce team is using to make sure their orchard is thriving, uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're perpetuating that practice. So it, it's hard, it, it's not easy, and I mean, I would actually um, ask you to put that question back to the team a little bit to say what are some of those root causes. We've had the conversations, okay. um, mm -hmm. but use of, like, some of the things that actually they mentioned the staff appreciated we would identify as huge contributors to the success. Um, purposeful use of time, listening to what educators think they need when it comes to that professional use of time so that they have time to collaboratively plan with one another. Um, ensuring that we are consistent in our message around what we think rigorous instruction is. These are, these are examples of things that I know Pierce has worked on and our practices we're working right now to spread across the entire administrative team. Did the superintendent direct me to ask you if there's any other root causes? So, there anything else that she didn't add? There are, and, <laughs> okay, I, and I think ahead. one of the things that would be helpful is um, expanding tutoring. I mean, we have, we have done some really intensive, purposeful tutoring before school, after school. We've used money effectively. We've yeah. used our own teachers um, to pay them to come in before and after school, and we've really deployed uh, most of that tutoring at first and second grade, um, and concentrated some of the support in those grades. I would like to see that expanded uh, both across the town and at Pierce. So I think that's a concrete thing um, that could be done um, that has a, a really high leverage. Good. All right. Thank you. This is a good way to the count. You're right here. You're right. This is good dialogue. Thank you. <laughs> More questions. Mr. Schlickman. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by this and I, I'd love to go into a lot more depth than I can now. For, but before I go there, I want to hit the aesthetic piece. I love the uh, green and pink on your bar <laughs> charts. Um, I, I'm very appreciative of somebody who goes and, and, and adjusts these uh, charts to make them tell a story. Uh, my critique is that I heard many times in this presentation, this is really wonderful, but it's not on the slide. If it's really wonderful, put it on the slide, okay? Because this is, this is really a permanent record. You've done a really great job. Uh, I've got, I'll ask 
you the question that, me, that probably won't ask others because I think you you really have this well thought out. Are there any con uh, content areas, types of literature, types of mathematics, types of questions, you know, uh, creating discourse, things that are underlying that you picked up on from your data that's not apparent to us that you've latched on to and you're acting upon? Yeah, uh, team, let me take this one or do you, would you like to? You can start. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Paul, I think it's a great question. I think one of the things um, that we've really focused on for the past two years is around student uh, discourse, which, um, and really thinking through, not just turning and talking and talking about what's going on, but really developing high level questions and, and turning more of the, um, uh, to use an ed term, heavy lifting on students. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and working on that through our mm -hmm. um, coaches, and I feel we're talking for Steph and Beth, <laughs> but, but really um, helping teachers um, develop those um, and giving more license to students to be able to have those <coughs> um, questions back and forth rather than going through, back through the teacher all the time. So it's kind of a granular move, but we're doing it across the school and, and have been for a while, and, and it just puts more ownership on the students to do the bulk of the learning and, and thinking. Yeah, I, I think that a focus on discourse is usually something that's behind this type of growth and these types of, gro types of growth numbers with kids. Because if they can communicate their knowledge, then, then you go and throw them through these tests and, and they're, they're going to do well. And it's going to reflect what they actually know. Uh, can I, I get. To that? Go ahead, go that? for it. Um, so, something that um, I've been thinking a lot about lately is sort of the. the inner systems within grade levels <clears throat> and what we do with our data, how we look at it. And over the last six years that I've been here, I've noticed every year teams being willing and eager to dive deeper mm -hmm. and to have conversations, gen ed, special ed, everyone at the table about what we're going to do about what we see. Mm -hmm. And that translates into the what they choose to include in that discourse when mm -hmm. they're, once they're in class at a tier one level and also what happens in our intervention groups. Mm -hmm. The other question is, is because I'm, I'm listening to you talk about your um, uh, newcomers and English learners, and you, you raise such a beautiful point from as an urban educator who's working that population. That's probably one of the most important things we can be doing. So my question, I guess, is bouncing over to this side of the room. Hi. Um, I, I sense the need of maybe additional social work support or something to. Uh, some sort of a district support for uh, <coughs> refugees, immigrant newcomers, and second language learners. Do we have any grant money or anything floating around this year that can support a little additional uh, additional services for these kids? Um, we do have the there's the, the homeless grant that mm -hmm. we do we do have funds for that's the allocation about initial allocation about thousand dollars per student mm -hmm. and um, we have about nine students that are eligible for those services mm -hmm. uh, or so we can get reimbursed for those those costs and then um, there'll be additional funds that'll be released to the district um, based on the per per day enrollment amount um, from Desi mm -hmm. Needless to say, Mr. Slickman, thousand dollars per student doesn't go very far. It's not a uh, social worker make, mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the things that I'll commend the Pierce team for thinking through is what resources would help our multilingual learners mm -hmm. this year, right now. And mm -hmm. so we've actually added an after-budget um, additional uh, SSP to Pierce that's posted mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, that's specifically intended to both help with some of the liaising work if we're able to hire a bilingual educator mm -hmm. uh, and with some of the um, inclusion uh, based MLL learning support that those mm -hmm. students might need. Yeah, thanks. That, that just feels so important to me. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. Um, so I wanted to ask about the absenteeism, which obviously there's been huge improvements, and I guess this is sort of a qualitative, like how close do you feel <laughs> um, like you're getting to the floor, right? Because there's going to be a floor, right? Event like we're not going to, it would be great if we got to 0% chronically absent students, but we're, we're not going to get there, right? So do you have any sense of, 
of you know with your general population it looks like it's hovering right around 10 ish you 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 did you got some movement this year um you're obviously whatever you're doing is working <laughs> i'm just curious if you have a sense of like how low you'll be able to drive that well, I tend to be an optimist on, on some of these, so I would say there's a long ways to go. Okay. I would like to see overall at 5% or under and single digits in every subcategory. Okay, good. That's helpful. Because it, it seems like what you're doing um, is driving that down pretty significantly, so it's helpful to hear from the people who are actually doing that work to get a sense of, of where we're headed. I think one thing that's important um, – for us to keep in mind as we do it is how obviously we can see trends amongst you know kids and families who are kids who are chronically absent families who have chronically absent children um, but one of the things that I feel very proud about in terms of meeting with families around this um, is that every single family has a different story about it and I don't say that to sound hokey I say that because it can really present some challenges for structurally what we do um, whether it's you know, a family who doesn't speak the same languages that I speak and how do I actually <coughs> meet with them? And that is a relatively surmountable hurdle. But I think that when we talk about wanting to get this to single digits and under 5%, um, really keeping that in mind that every single family may need a custom-made intervention after we do the, well, of course we meet with them, of course we communicate, of course we advocate. And then what comes after that really does get down to that individual level. Great, great. Um, and then just the other piece is, you know, we are obviously very focused on ELA, and I know nobody's <coughs> losing sight of the math. <laughs> um, I, I know you're not, um, but it, it and it the the goals are fantastic, and the the work is amazing, and the gaps are closing in math. So I'm not like worried. It's just you know, as somebody who works in higher ed with um, non traditional students without foundational math skills. Um, it's still really important, yay math. Um, so we just want to make sure we're we're still talking about it. I'm I'm sure you are. There's no way you, there's no way that you're not talking about it and getting these kind of outcomes. But I do think we sometimes have to to say it. So well, and we have to get creative too. Um, so I obviously have seen um, our implementing teams work really hard this year um, on the EL, and it becomes absorbing. <laughs> but those are some of the teams who are still reaching out to me and asking, you know, what can I do about this? Um, I have several uh, teachers in the building who um, are interested in trying some of the building thinking classroom strategies and working in-house on that because they aren't able to go to the PD that we're offering around it. So we still have a lot of excitement around math. Um, Good. And I'm sure that will continue. That's awesome. Yay math. Yay math. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. Holman wanted. I just want to add on to what um, this team was saying about the chronic absenteeism efforts and the every single family has their own story and how many resources it then takes. <clears throat> if there's a single family in a situation where access to after school is the thing um, that's going to make sure that they are able to be at school, stay at school, and not have consistent absenteeism or if access to a before school program is the thing then this is why we put resources in the strategic plan towards things like that because each time we try to resolve one of those challenges for students it's going to take a resource that's going to take financial investment um, and the strategic plans goals are aimed at that and I know that um, I can count on the peers team to be one of the first that will call us up and say hey are there scholarships for a family for whom this is going to make a really big difference pretty sure we had that phone call today so mm -hmm. like but it takes resources and that's the point I want to make is that like the resources we've committed for each and every one of these families there's usually a resource whether that's a human one and the time that they're going to put in to making that phone call and doing that communication or a scholarship or an additional reading specialist or one of those um, and those are critical to the efforts that result in results like these Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Skittleson. You are, there you go. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, 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 this is, I think I know the answer to this question, but to follow on to the discussion about the absenteeism, I know, Andrew, that this has been a huge focus of yours, and it's really exciting to see on paper what it's accomplished. Um, and this follows on a little bit to what Dr. Holman said, like, you've done really well, you've done a lot. What 
is it is it that you just and not just is it primarily that you want to be able to do more of the same of what has been successful or are there specific things you can tell us that you would like to try that you haven't been able to try because they haven't those resources have been harder to get or aren't available and um, I'd just like to hear about that as we move forward. Laura, I think I mostly um, understand your question. I think one of the things that um, improves chronic absenteeism is direct outreach. And whether that's from me, uh, Ms. McEwen, social worker, calling directly, meeting directly, whether it's at the school or at a home or anywhere else um, matters. And that takes time and it <coughs> takes kind of a tenaciousness that I think, um, you know, requires the people like at the schools to do it. But of course, an additional resource that is helpful are community members, potentially liaisons in the community that, that, that know folks. Um, because the more that we can amplify how important it is to be at school when you're not seriously ill, we know it will lead to better uh, outcomes. So Ms. Gittleson, I'm not sure I'm answering your, your question directly here, but more connections uh, to folks in the town. Um, and, and I think, um, just a, a willingness um, to meet folks where they are um, is something that goes a long way. And, um, you know, there's a lot that I need to learn, right? Like I, I, I study up a lot on chronic absenteeism and we have not met our, our goal. So I, I'm proud of the trend, but um, we're, we're in we've no way made it yet. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Ms. Exton? absentee mm -hmm. conversation here um, I, I think something that you are not saying that I'm gonna sort of say for you is I think that another piece of this is the relationships that you have clearly mm -hmm. built with these families because um, as we talk about resources you know in my head I'm like well we could have some position where their job is to go to these people's homes or call them but I don't think families are gonna respond to just anybody they're responding because you are their child's teacher, their child's assistant principal, their child's social worker. Um, and so I think that you all should take a lot of credit also for the relationships that you are building with these families, that they trust you to, to get them the resources that they need to get their kids to school. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Exton. Okay. Everyone has asked my question, so I'm just going to make a comment. Sorry, I'm getting... Um, so I had some of those chronically absent children because of illness, but because of various lingering things. And I'm just throwing that out there to suggest that as you talk to families, if you work with them to find out what it is that they need in terms of um, support for health for the student in the school, even if they're only at school for like <coughs> half a day, um, I know it might have been possible for my child to have attended more. We'd still probably be chronically absent, but uh, there's definitely, and, and I'm thinking, especially with COVID going on in RSV, and it, you know, it just feels like there's more illness out there that's causing more significant issues. And if you happen to have one of those lucky children, um, that's something that hasn't been mentioned and, and I think should be being thought about. So um, I think that's everything. Thank you very much. This is a great presentation. Thank you. Thank and you for having us. We enjoyed hearing from you. Okay. And next we have <coughs> Brackett. Introduce. <coughs> All right. While well, they get settled. Um, we did print copies for folks who are sticking around of the bracket. Did you put it over there? I put it right over there. Awesome. So you can follow along even though you can't see on our flash screen behind me um, the slides. So I just want to say the bracket team has a brand new, fully brand new <laughs> administrative team this year. So welcome, Dr. Weiss, Mr. Amaral. Um, this is our new principal and assistant principal of Brackett Elementary School. They have really <coughs> hit the ground running and getting started. Uh, Brackett is in phenomenal shape. We've heard wonderful things about their leadership at the school so far. I know they've been working hard on systems and structures um, and routines and getting to know everybody and doing entry plans all as they start the school year. So 
I'm sure they'll have wonderful things to share with us about what they're up to and looking forward to this year. <clears throat> Thank it's all you. yours. All right. So first of all, I really want to first express our um, gratitude for our bracket community, which has really embraced us, our students, our faculty, our staff, our families have really um, opened their arms to us. And that has made a huge difference in the way that we've been able to begin this school year. And so I want to begin this presentation first by thanking them. Um, again, I'm Dr. Gretchen Weiss. I'm the principal at Brackett. And with me is... I'm Michael Vanderlein, the assistant principal at Brackett. I said the wrong last name. I'm sorry. Oh, Recently no. married. Recently, <laughs> yes. Um, and we also have members of our school community here with us, our coaches, our, spe um, our special ed coordinator, um, and our school council also um, sends their regards. So thank you all for coming. Um, so our purpose um, for this presentation was to really accompany the school improvement plan that was given to you and really highlight our major wins and opportunities for improvement. We want to provide you with a narrative around our first few months, our first 45 days with our students. And as such, we've organized our presentation into three major categories, thinking about our joy, our growth, and then how we are thinking about moving forward <coughs> and thinking about belonging. And we'll start with joy because it's been an absolute joy getting to know the Brackett School community. Um, and we've been able to celebrate so many wins as we Im implement our entry plan. I joined Dr. Weiss this summer uh, as we considered our interviews as we, um, along with the strategic priorities of the district. And it was clear communication and feeling safe and supported were very important to our school community. We spent time connecting with families, with staff, uh, and, and faculty and our community partners as we built up our relationships with them. We hosted meetups and some informal events such as Popsicles with the Principal back in August. It was a wonderful uh, turnout, a great way to meet families and, to, and, and make that first connection with them. And it was a great launch to our back to school week. Uh, we worked with families around chronic absenteeism and IEP support by meeting and creating plans for these students and these families prior to the start of the school year. Um, our focus was and continues to be ensuring that all of our students have access to an empowering educational experience um, as, at, at, at Bracket. These connections and conversations, they really form the web of support that we have, and we were able to kind of uh, <coughs> refine our existing operational systems of the building. Some of those refinements were adjustments to our arrival and our attendance procedures, with the goal of having all students in the building ready to learn by 8 a.m. Um, to help with this, we've established a safety patrol with our fifth grade students um, as they accompany their, our, our learners into the building. There's a picture there on the bottom right of that slide. Um, and it's been a, a wonderful moment for them to serve as their role models for their younger learners. And more importantly, to create that deeper connection, contribution, and collaboration to our school community to foster that sense of belonging for them. And so it's been a joy watching our students really thrive in that way. Uh, we've refined some logistical and operational uh, systems, such as our evacuation and safety procedures and protocols. We've developed scheduling that supports the implementation of EL. We've clarified our communications through weekly family newsletters, uh, regular updates to our website, as well as our own internal communications. And uh, thinking back to our opening day uh, with our faculty, uh, it was a day that was full of, it's, it's some, full of excitement and joy as we did a lot of foundational work uh, to co-create the path ahead for Brackett. We extended this work by engaging our families and student council. And in the picture that you see here is one of our core activities we did where we sourced input from our stakeholders uh, for words that describe the future of Brackett, our hopes, our desires. Um, how we want to be described, how we want our students to be described, and ultimately um, what our goals are for Bracket together. And through an iterative process, we'll continue to engage stakeholders, um, and this will form our school-wide expectations to work in concert with our district initiatives of multi-tiered systems of support. We revitalized our ACE meetings, our student study team process as well, to enhance the way all of our focal groups equitably experience uh, the strategic priorities of the district <coughs> and their time at Bracket. And through our joyful work with the Bracket community, we used all of this as a stepping stone to dive in deep to, the, to our data and form our school improvement plan, which Dr. Weiss will share with you now. So it's important for us that joy leads to growth so that we're using a strengths-based approach to address our needs. And Michael and I are still meeting with different constituencies and really listening and learning from them as we 
use our beliefs about education and their dreams for the community to build what we want for Brackett. Um, as far as our school improvement plan, we began by identifying growth areas and looking at the data for our 425 students and 70 plus faculty and staff. We have some really good wins, some foundations to stand on. We made substantial progress towards our state goals, especially true in mathematics, where we reached or exceeded 2023 targets for all students in most of our subgroups. Um, in math last year at Brackett, the Brackett community focused on expecting high engagement in math discussions, and we think that some of those pieces have um, definitely influenced that. Um, that success was echoed in our panorama data that looked specifically where our students were responding about the, the fact that their teachers had rigorous expectations for them, and that was seen as the, the biggest increase in our panorama data in the spring. Um, Chronic absenteeism overall improved, and though Michael said it's still a priority for us, and we were still making individual plans with students at the beginning of the year. Um, at the same time, while we're seeing some trends towards improvement in our literacy data through our dibbles, um, our overall, um, there was a slight increase in our English language arts data, but many of those categories did not go up. Um, especially the gap between our high needs and our non-high needs. Um, but when we started to look at our corresponding panorama data, which you can see here, when we looked at some of those subgroups within that high needs category, our students with disabilities and our students without disabilities, really the, the gap in that was something that we wanted to prioritize, especially within our English language arts. So this was a, a, sub, a focal group that we really identified, which corresponds with the district's initiatives as that being a focal group. There were some relative weaknesses in cultural awareness and action, despite work on this in the previous year, both on, in the um, faculty panorama results as well as in um, our student results. So this gave us, um, the sort of the, the meat which, which we were gonna build our school improvement plan. And we wanted to develop a plan that was aligned to the district plan, clear, intentionally demonstrated connection between the goals. Because as we're two new administrators, really thinking about how can we work and meet many of these goals at the same time, thinking about those action steps. <coughs> so we wanted these to intertwine. And the way that we did that was by thinking about three guiding questions as we developed this. And so we looked at how do we inspire all of our learners, how do we use data to focus our initiatives, and how do we build connections for everyone? And so those echo through all of our strategic plan goals. Dr. Weiss, do you want to tell them what this thing is? Oh, yeah. I'll, so okay. we'll, we'll tell and then come, we, can, we can look back. Okay. Uh, so you want to go? Yeah. So, our, um, so our, this is the four goals for our school improvement plan. Um, our academic, first academic goal really centers on English language arts and that gap between students with disabilities and students without disabilities. Our second academic goal fosters conditions for deeper learning and integrating the EL high leverage practices across all the disciplines. Um, our culture and climate goal and our strategic family engagement goal are both identifying needs for growth and belonging, specifically thinking about um, including more voice student voice, family voice, and making sure that there's open communication path, um, within, those, um, within those groups. And with each of those, we're also thinking about that, that subgroup of students with disabilities and families with students with disabilities in those. Um, and so for our first question was, how do we inspire all learners? Um, and for that, we wanted to build on, the, on pro the protocols that we used in last year's math discussions and think about how could we, again, use protocols as we implement the EL curriculum really intensively in first and third grades and through the high leverage practices across the school. So the pictures that we have here are actually the magnificent things that the first graders created in their first, pro um, in their first unit for EL. So this first unit had the first graders think about what is a problem within their classroom that they want to solve. 
So some of the things um, that are featured on this slide to the left is a talking stick. They said that way everybody's voice could be heard at, at the meeting. There's a lost and found that has different, cate different boxes for different sized things so that little things wouldn't get lost at the bottom of the box. <coughs> and in the front is stuffy land, which houses stuffies when they come to school, which for first graders <laughs> is a really big problem if their stuffies aren't just stuffed in their locker. So they took that, and then the first graders crafted paragraphs with focal statements and supporting details. And when asked about these details, the first graders talked about how they couldn't just list attributes, but they had to explain why in those details. So their ability to write and expand upon what they're writing is really increasing. How do we use data to inform decision making? As a school, we're really working to expand our qualitative data collection and use both qualitative and quantitative data in our, uh, really intentionally in our, um, in our teaching. So on this slide, you can see an evidence from a conversation in an ACE meeting in which teachers broke down the sort of composite Dibble scores, right? So your Dibbles and you're looking at that early literacy screener and so they broke those down into different, the different components and put each child in a class <coughs> on a different post-it note. And that way they could move those around and think about different flexible grouping possibilities in tier one and tier two instruction so that they could think um, about what are the different ways that they could really target that instruction. And they mapped this on a visual of the MTSS or multi-tiered system of support process to really think about how tier one and tier two instruction work together. And this in really allowed us to have an amazing dynamic discussion in that ACE meeting where, um, and think about how we could double dip into that so kids are getting not just one access to that <coughs> curriculum, but again, getting it multiple times. And so finally, how do we build connections for everyone? We really wanted to build on the amazing work that has been done um, with our Rainbow Alliance and our Belonging Club that's beginning and the model of the Student Council that was begun last year to bring more student voice into what we're thinking about. Um, and another way we did was during our joint time together on November 1st, was really that that time together was really integral to getting all the voices, our teachers, our paraprofessionals, our specialists, all together to focus on our students with disabilities, specifically thinking about how they, their feelings of belonging could be thought about throughout the school. We first started with conversations about thinking about our own relationship with disability and then how that influenced us in our teaching. And then we broke into different teams and talked about our students individually, thinking about who are their friends who is an adult within the school that they feel connected to? And if we couldn't name that for students, what did we need to do specifically for those individual students to make them feel connected to the bracket community? We'll continue this work with empathy interviews in the spring with our, students, uh, with our families of students with disabilities and are having support from the district in that. So this brings us to sort of thinking about where we're thinking up for the future. Um, it's important to Michael and I that our vision includes creating space and time for student agency, um, student voice, a plan for collaboration that's explicit and actionable, and thinking about how we're going to include teachers, and by that I'm including all grown-ups who are in our building as they are all teachers to our students in way, different ways and how they can see themselves as leaders of their professional growth and in making school-wide decisions. And we both want to thank you for having us <laughs> engage in this really important work in Arlington. Um, we feel really honored and proud to be here. Thank you. Um, anyone have any questions? Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Um, so Ms. Exton has asked for um, a presentation later in the year about the student success teams, SSTs. But I did notice that you talk about redevelopment of the SST to process to support MTSS. 
What, what exactly does that look like? How are you changing the process? Mm -hmm. Can you just talk about that sure. a little bit? Sure. Um, one of the things that we really did is we really wanted to make sure that um, we were utilizing all of our, uh, all of our teachers and, and educators to the best ability as far as their, their resource time with time as well as their expertise. One of the big changes we did with our SST process is we've changed who we bring into the meeting. For example, if there's like a student um, that they were concerned about who has a need for OT and maybe reading support, we're gonna bring those two, we're gonna bring our reading coach in, we're gonna bring our OT person in, as well as the general educator, as opposed to a, a grade, I think before we had a grade <coughs> level team, or we had a, a team that was represented from one just general ed teacher of every grade level. Other thing that we do is we do a pre-study, we do a collaborative document where a lot of the educators and the whole team comes together, where we do kind of an analysis, we all weigh in. So when we come to that meeting, we do a 30-minute protocol that's very focused, that's very uh, in intervention-based about what we can do as part of our Tier 1 support to really enhance what students are getting in the Gen Ed curriculum built upon our district accommodation plans. Great, thank you. Mr. Schlickman? Love the presentation. Um, the fact that both of you are new to the district and come from different places, I glad to have somebody with an art and music background coming in in a leadership position. That's always that's always a blessing for a school, because the first thing you said was joy, and I, I can sense that you're trying to bring that in. Uh, absolutely. Um, tell me about. I mean, I, I want to know about your entry plan, basically how it feels to come into this new environment because, you know, fish don't know about the water, but you're, this is a highly successful school and you're highly successful educators in different venues and you're really good and that's why you're here. T tell me about how it feels to come into Bracket and what you're seeing and what surprised you. Um, so I think I feel really lucky in a lot of ways as we came into Bracket. Um, the conversations that I had at the beginning, especially with our coaches, have been really open and honest. Mm -hmm. And people have been willing to um, take risks with us and mm -hmm. tell us how they really feel about things, mm -hmm. which has been really helpful. Um, I think I was a little worried at the beginning that everybody would say, oh, it's everything is great, everything is great. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and what yet we've found is people are starting to bring things to us to say like, hey, we want to collaborate on this problem. We see that you're really interested in working with us on this. And, um, and at points we're like, wow, there's, everybody's bringing things to us. Mm -hmm. and, and yet that really feels like we're starting to build some trust with this community. Mm -hmm. um, it's an it's amazing community. Mm -hmm. There are incredible teachers. The families are so dedicated to their, <coughs> their students and to making Bracket just a really lovely place. And so um, I'm glad that they're also able to think about how they want to grow mm -hmm. um, because I think that's been really helpful. For sure. Uh, to echo Dr. Weiss too, you know, um, hearing for, from our staff and faculty as they have been bringing concerns to us too, what I really love about that is that it demonstrates their faith and their trust in us and that's mm -hmm. an incredible honor to have. Mm -hmm. um, and not only that, they, they take risks along with us and they mm -hmm. allow us to do that. They allow us to go along with this ride mm -hmm. um, and say, hey, let's try it out, which, mm -hmm. which is awesome to be a part of. It creates this really infectious energy throughout mm -hmm. the building. Um, and what's been great, especially for me too, is that Bracket has just been an incredibly welcoming mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. um, uh, from the moment that you walk in, into those doors, staff are asking you who, just, just about you as a person, mm -hmm. not necessarily just about the, the upper professional side. And one of the things I said in my, in my interview is that I'm really looking for the opportunity to make sure that uh, we can humanize one, one, mm -hmm. one another. Mm -hmm. um, and that has been a huge, huge blessing as part of a, as part of our treatment. You caused quite a commotion over yeah, here. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm too much joy. Yeah, it's no, just I'm, a I'm, lot I'm, of excitement, <laughs> a lot of joy, and the whole thing is uh, nuts. I, I'm excited for yeah, you. Yeah. I'm excited for the bracket community. Welcome to Arlington, and thank you, uh, thank you, you so could do much. like a Coca-Cola commercial. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, it's, it's yeah. 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 Turn it good off. for you. Yeah, you turn it off. I didn't turn it off yet. You turn it off. I, I flipped it this way. <laughs> Okay, well, Mr. Schlickman is working on that. Anyone else have any <laughs> other questions? Welcome. And we have Glad a big bag of rice. <laughs> um, okay, um, I was going to ask. So, since he's busy, I'll ask the question he usually asks, which is we're coming into budget season. What do you need from us? <laughs> what do you need from us? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I'm also an Arlington resident, and so I was really excited about the override. Um, I think, you know, compensation is definitely a, a thing that we all have to be thinking about, um, especially for um, our paraprofessionals and the way that we can support them. They are really um, outstanding educators as well at Brackett, and I think um, a fair, really good compensation for them is, mm -hmm. is helpful. Um, I think that um, we're also thinking about um, our facilities and, and excited that our playground is, is part of this new um, <coughs> the spring plan, um, but also thinking about how are we thinking about our, our schools as learning environments and seeing what we've learned as far as the learning environments from the high school to think about how we could think about the spaces um, at, our, at the other schools and at Brackett to have communal spaces for learning and, and thinking about those those pieces as well. And so those are things that we're, we're thinking about um, just in general. I think next year I'll, I would have a just um, maybe a little bit more detailed list for you as we've, we've gotten through a year. Um, but those are things on our mind. May Thank I follow you. up? Please. Dr. Vice, I'm so when you talk about the spaces in the building, you're talking about a, like a recon, like a make them like this building? <clears throat> Not necessarily, but thinking about like outdoor space. Oh, outdoor space, How, do we, yeah. how yeah. do we think about that as far as like outdoor classrooms oh, or okay. bringing kids together? And, nice. And okay. how can we, can we okay. do that? You know, I think when we see the safety patrol and we see the fifth graders yeah. and the first graders and second graders and the relationships they're building, how can we build those things within a school um, that's comprised of a lot of little boxes, right? And so thinking about that is something that I think okay. is important to us. How's your, your staffing for uh, custodians and to keep the building clean? <laughs> good. They've been doing a really good job. Yeah, I'm sure they're doing really a good job. I'm not saying they're not, but do you have enough? Um, we have someone in the morning and someone that comes <laughs> later. In the that day. is such a <laughs> diplomatic answer. You got to, <laughs> that's really good. That's like that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Curtin. Uh, so we were doing more. so well, Len. Go ahead. <laughs> I think I'm done. Yeah. You can tell. So just, a, just a follow-up question on that. So for a while, Bracket, before you were there, but Bracket was so crowded that every single space was being used as a classroom that could possibly be used as a classroom, including the, the science room. So I, I know that the pressure is sort of off now. The number of sections is, is down. Are you reusing that space? Are you reclaiming it? Well, how are you using some of those spaces? Um, so we had, we went, we did have one classroom that came, that went, we went down a classroom mm -hmm. size. Um, we actually <clears throat> used that space and put um, back in a teacher space where teachers could be together and collaborate um, and work together. Mm -hmm. And and that was seen with, with a lot of excitement from our, our faculty. Our PTO actually came in and decorated the entire space for them so they could felt like a homey space where they could feel like they could be together and have conversations. It also gives us another meeting space um, so that we can have larger group meetings as well. So, um, so we moved the people who are in that space into a, a slightly larger space mm -hmm. um, and, and then allowed the teachers to use that as collaboration space. Great, thank you. Anything else? Dr. Hummel? I just wanna say it's been wonderful to have the two of you join the team, You're doing great work. I can't wait to see what's next. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, you like very much. Apples? Do you want to make an apple? I, one? Sorry, I don't have an orchard <laughs> analogy for you. <laughs> I think I, think I spent it. For it's done. Pick another fruit. <laughs> Oranges. <laughs> Aren't you nice? Aren't you nice? There you go. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, thank you very nice much job, for coming. Everybody. Just okay. a moment have worms. You know. <laughs> next. <laughs> have um, a great night. Goodbye. Okay. Get some sleep. Yeah. <laughs> so next we have the buffer zone report by mm -hmm. Dr. Holman. Yeah. All right. Um, I have included in your materials all of the enrollment data for this week in this agenda item. So the enrollments are not in my superintendent's update as they usually are. It's all included here, um, including a <coughs> snapshot of October 1 data from October 1 last year to October 1 this year in the typical format of the enrollment report. So I just want to go over quickly a purpose um, an overview reminder of what the buffer zones exactly are. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about a 
the buffer zone assignments for this year, comparison with last year, um, a grade level breakdown and a few trends, go over a class size overview, an open <laughs> enrollment overview, and um, a vague over, uh, or not a vague, but a, like a brief overview of open enrollment trends. I put the trends together so I don't have buffer zone trends and, op and enrollment trends separated in this presentation as I did last year. So just as a reminder for the public and for um, the committee, our buffer zones are addresses on or near certain elementary school district boundaries. There are buffer zones between each one of our elementary schools. Um, and the goal of this report is to give you an overview of the implementation of the policy and its effectiveness in maintaining balanced class sizes um, and how the policy is working towards improving balanced class sizes. Uh, and its effectiveness in doing so. <clears throat> so, here are our uh, here's our breakdown of buffer zone assignments for this school year, 23-24. Uh, the vast majority of families were able to get their first choice of buffer zone assignment. Some families received their second choice of buffer zone assignment for the most part those who received a second choice were those who registered later on and we already had some constraints with regards to class sizes by the time they were registering and so if they were registering in a place where we had a hot spot or a section that um, really just couldn't take another student then they would be placed in the buffer zone that was their second choice um, wherever there were siblings the family received their first choice to make sure that we were keeping siblings together as is articulated in the policy and we had a total of 120 buffer zones uh, buffer zone registrations this school year that's down 10 from the previous school year you'll notice that uh, bracket had compared to last year fewer um, buffer zone students that Stratton um, was right on par with where it's been and then there's the comparison for all of the other schools for you to review. Happy to answer questions about any of those. There's a grade level breakdown for um, all of the different schools, the number of students who were assigned to that school's buffer zone for each grade level. Of course, a lot more of them um, at the kindergarten level than at any of the other um, levels, but we had a lot of third graders enter in buffer zones incidentally um, this year. I also want to give a class size overview and comparison. So on this chart, it's going to show the average class size October 1 of 2023 and the average class size on October 1 of 2022. Um, last year when I provided this snapshot, it was not based on October 1 data. It was based on data taken at some point in October. This is actually the October 1 calculation of class average class size um, in the snapshot. So if you see uh, class size highlighted in blue across 23 to 22, <coughs> then that means there's been a decrease in the average class size from last year to this year of more than two students. If it's yellow, that indicates an increase in the average class size of more than two students from last year to this year. And if it is um, not shaded in any way, then it's a change of um, equal to or less than two students <coughs> per so one of the things that you'll notice is that in second grade, we've had a decrease in class size for the most part. In first grade, we've had an increase in class size for the most part. Um, and in fourth grade, we've had a few schools where the class size has gone up from last year to this year. Some of that has to do with sort of bumper um, groups of students moving into new grade levels. For open enrollment, there's an overview here. If you recall, last year we're sort of getting our trend data in line with open enrollment. And so last year I, I grouped 2021 from the time I had entered the district through 2023 into one report. So this includes that column all the way on the right, uh, as well as the open enrollment placements for um, this past school year. So, um, so actually, no, for this school year. So these are open enrollments for 23-24 school year in the table. Um, so we've had a number at bracket who are open enrolled at bracket. Um, you'll see there there's five. Um, and then from 21 to 23, we had eight students who were op open enrolled at bracket. Uh, and then as we move through the years, I'll be able to show a little bit more of sort of a trajectory if we have schools that have more open enrollments <coughs> than other schools and we can take a look at why that might be. Um, for the most part, open enrollment was so that um, 
families whose personal circumstances change at some point during their student's elementary experience could maintain connection with their child's school community if they had a few more years left. Some open enrollment approvals more recently have been due to extenuating circumstances for students whose current placement is no longer meeting their needs. So we've had a few situations where we've approved an open enrollment for those reasons. Those are the last two bullets on this, um, on this slide. Back up to the top of the slide, there were fewer kindergarten enrollments in 2024, 2023-24 uh, for this school year and fewer buffer zone assignments overall. We have been trying to swing, last year if you recall, we were trying to swing away from the Stratton district um, because of class size constraints and the fact that we had brought the kindergarten section down sections down to three. In, incidentally, we ended up with a very small kindergarten class at Stratton that year, not necessarily because of the swing away, just because of how enrollment shook out. This year we're trying to swing away from, I was trying to swing away from t the Thompson district as much as we could because we had some anticipated space constraints. There were 31 buffer submissions in a Thompson buffer zone. Um, only 11 of those students were assigned to Thompson. Luckily, only one actually only got their second choice um, because the other students who were in a Thompson buffer zone selected the other school. Uh, so it, that worked out in terms of people's choices, but we were able to <coughs> shift a lot of students out of Thompson um, through the buffer zone process. We're maintaining lower class sizes, like I said, in grade two than in FY23, um, and we may look to reduce the number of sections as those students move into grade three, depending on how those projections are looking for next year. We are maintaining higher class sizes in grades one and four than we did last year. In grade one, that's due in part to we had a lot of unanticipated new enrollments late in the summer. Families who either had chosen to do kindergarten somewhere else and then come back to Arlington in grade one, that is a trend that happens every year, but we had more than anticipated this year. And then in grade four, the class size increase is pretty significantly less um, notable than in grade one. If you look at those numbers, the grade one increase is more significant. Um, so I'm happy to speak to any of these trends or try to answer any questions that you might have about them. We do have uh, projections that Mr. Mason has been working on as we think about budgeting for next year, and we'll start putting projections together for that um, very soon. Great. Thank you very much. Um, any questions, Mr. Schlickman? Okay. Um, one of the reasons why this report is sort of important to us is that it, it's a it, it helps us to evaluate our policy and whether or not the buffer zones are working. Mm -hmm. And the one bit of information, I think it's probably too difficult to do at such an early level, but uh, it would, I would certainly appreciate going forward, is to be able to take a look at each buffer zone and see where people within that zone are asking to go. Mm -hmm. uh, because maybe some buffer zones aren't really buffering that much and maybe some places we need to expand the buffer zone by a little bit. We, you know, we, we, we put this together in 2012, and I think we did a pretty good job of it, but it's certainly something worth reviewing uh, on a regular basis to see if the boundaries make sense. This was a lot easier to do when we had the GIS system that had the map that actually mm -hmm. gave us a visual, mm -hmm. and that has been down, which made this year's report a little bit <laughs> yeah. more manual of a process, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but I can say that one of the trends we definitely see, because all as, as I'm approving, buffer zones will often look up an address just mm -hmm. to see where the family falls. If there is a major road in between where they live and the school mm -hmm. that they're um, the, is their second choice, mm -hmm. that's a major factor in determining what their first choice or their second choice is. By and large, also, um, this is harder for me to say for last year because we didn't have the maps up, but one of the things we could see in the maps previous to that mm -hmm. is what the um, original districted school was. Mm -hmm. Families select for the original districted school more times than not because the kids in that area, mm -hmm. they've made friends in their neighborhood, and those kids are <clears throat> going to mm -hmm. the originally districted school. So that's um, – it still is useful to be able to say where we have a hot spot. I'm sorry, but your assignment's going to be at this other school. Um, yeah. it, has, it has made mm -hmm. certain hot spots not become so desperately crowded that we have to add a section. So that has def it's definitely mitigating that. However, the Thompson buffer zones are not super useful only because 
the of the pond where it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and because it's not a very big spread into the bishop buffer zone. So if we were to make any adjustments, and one of the things I wouldn't mind looking with Mr. Mason at soon is a map to determine whether or not it would make sense to expand the Thompson buffer zone towards bishop, the, the bishop buffer zone towards Stratton to give a little more room there. Um, it's going to depend on what the trends are looking like for Thompson over the next few years because they really are out of space. When we drew the maps originally, uh, the state came in and they said, you'd better do this because we're funding your Thompson School and we don't believe you're going to fill it. Uh, obviously, uh, we've added six classrooms since and we're still crowded. So that the, par the, the paradigm that we were trying to address in 2012 is a totally different circumstance that we're experiencing here, here in 2023. And I remember the way we drew the tail down Pleasant Street on the east side of Pleasant Street, putting that in a Thompson buffer, uh, was really because we needed to draw more kids in. And I don't know geographically how much sense that made, and I bet you're not getting any kids going to Thompson from that neighborhood anyway. Nope. Now, I live in a Thompson Bishop zone, uh, north of Mass Ave. Uh, we also did struggle with the boundary of Hardy going across Mass Ave, which was historical, mm -hmm. and the problem with Park Avenue versus Bracket and Down was also another problem that we had when we were drawing the original lines. So I can see places where we struggled um, 11 years ago making these maps and maybe it's time for us to uh, sit around and and figure them out again and uh, obviously with the GIS down at this point it's this isn't the time to do it but at some point we should be able to get the data together and start thinking about tweaking these things mm -hmm. thank you Morgan. I think, and I think if we do that, we want to take a look at the language in the policy again, just to make sure that it's um, it, not that it's being obviously, it's not being implemented inconsistently. The, but the policy, because of when it was written, prioritizes the maintenance of these 2011 original school zones, mm -hmm. right, as the sort of like primary, mm -hmm. um, and then parental request is actually per the policy is sort of like a secondary mm -hmm. piece of it, which um, maybe doesn't make as much sense now, mm -hmm. um, given that it's been, you know, 12 years since 2011. Um, so I, I think they could be looked at in, mm -hmm. um, we did, we did uh, do some work um, on this in budget right before COVID. Um, the mm -hmm. GIS gentleman came and um, we looked at houses and dots and there was like a lot there's a lot going on um but i i, I think it'd be really hard to do um without gis data so thank you do we get the gis data from the town or did we have our own we got that there was a the guy town. i know there was yeah. a, had a guy, platform like... that was coded with mm -hmm. the information that allowed you to kind of look up any address and maintained all of the requests within it. Mm -hmm. um, I believe we can still get some of the GIS data from the town, but it's not linked up with our buffer zone data, so we'd have to cross-reference it. Okay. Uh, and I can, I mean, we can work with the IT team and see what would be possible so that we can take a look at some of those maps again. Okay. Um, I guess the one question that I have um, is, these are what you've given us is helpful, but I'm just wondering part of what the policy was asking is how much good do the buffer zones do? What, what would the class sizes be if we didn't have the buffer zones? And this was in part to prove to the people who live in the buffer zones who are not happy about having buffer zones that we were actually making a difference. Mm -hmm. And so that's something to be thinking about going forward. I mean, it looks, from what you're saying in terms of the numbers, it looks like, yes, it, it is making a difference. It's just that is actually a question that, <coughs> honestly, I'm not, at, at this point, part of the reason we had it in there was that when this, when we did this redistricting, 
people were not happy. Mm -hmm. They were seriously not happy. And so we needed to show them that <clears throat> we were getting something for their unhappiness. Um, I'm not sure people are as unhappy now. Uh, so it's mm -hmm. not as big a deal, mm -hmm. but if we're talking about changing the buffer zone, we'd have to show the impact of the change. I th mm -hmm. Well, I think showing that buffer zones period help. And then, you know, yeah. if we change the buffer zone, it will help more. I think is important. Mm -hmm. Without yeah. the GIS platform, it would be exceptionally difficult to do a comparison now against like, what would it be right. had we never? Right, right. That's, mm -hmm. it, it may be that we can't do but that until we have. But if we redrew boundaries for the buffer zones or made them slightly larger, it would be easy enough to say, and here's the number of residences that would newly fall and the potential impact that could have on, say, Thompson enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, that we could probably do with data we have available to us. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And I think buffer zones helped us a lot when our enrollment was like skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. and if we're going to see a contraction, which I don't think is going to have the same kind of slope as our growth, there's no reason to expect it's gonna look like that. But still in times of contraction, buffer zones can also be helpful because mm -hmm. they can, they're, they're cost savings, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So can help. They, they, they're not, um, they still matter, a lo they matter the least, I think at times of like enrollment stability, right? But when you're on those, movements they they do really um they can really help <coughs> Mr. Yeah. Cardin. i mean and, and the other I, there's a lot of questions we could ask about buffer zones and so i think it would be you know a, a new subcommittee or something else to figure out what the questions are that we want to get to i mean one question i have is if everybody who applies in february is getting their first choice then you know do we really need it to create anxiety for those long-term residents, right? Because that's the people who, you know, they've lived here, their kids are playing on the playground of their neighborhood school, but they may end up getting assigned to a different school because they happen to be in a buffer zone. That's still the complaint that we hear, right? So if we're not using it that way, if those kids are still going to their closest school they, where they're playing on the playground, then for me, that's a question I'd like to interrogate. Do we really need to create that anxiety? So I think there's, there's a variety of questions. It's sort of a, you know, more than just is it effective that um, we would want to look at. I would say that the, the, the moment in which I most appreciate the existence of the buffer zones is in July and August when we are in the situation where little fluctuations make a really big difference mm -hmm. in terms of the resources we need to provide at any one school and we've filled the sections in, and we have a sense of what our staffing is, and it's pretty locked in, and hiring additional staff at that point is going to be really hard and disruptive and expensive. Um, and so, so were we to interrogate some of those questions, making sure we have those mechanisms to balance when we have seven elementary schools and mm -hmm. three to four <coughs> to two sometimes sections at each grade level at each one, um, you, that bit of flexibility that these give is very appreciated at that point <coughs> in the enrollment process. Yeah, I think the buffer zones have gotten into the culture of the community and people have accepted them as sort of something that, that we do rather than it being a totally new thing in 2012. I spent more time and got more caffeine doing meetups with people who were concerned on buffer zones that year than I've probably done with coffee <clears throat> since then because it was like every weekend it's like two or three groups of parents who wanted to talk talk about buffer zones and how we're going to do it um and if the system is working so that it tends to be the people who are registering late and people who are new to town who are most at risk of being assigned across a line um i i think that that sort of takes the edge off of uh, folks who are uh, longtime residents and get in on the first week of registration and make sure that, that you know, that they're in the queue for the school that they want. So it sounds like it's working. Good. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So next we have 
the superintendent's evaluation. This is something that we do every year as required by the state. Uh, let me pull this up. So what we have all done is filled out the form, which is called end of cycle summative evaluation report. We've each filled it out um, separately and everyone submitted their copies to me, which I appreciate. Um, and then I as chair have created a <coughs> compilation. Uh, this year I did a compilation, which is just a, the appending of everyone's comments. Uh, I didn't try and, and summarize or, or um, condense what was written. Uh, the other thing I've done is part of the evaluation is we have to check different uh, like performance towards goals and mm -hmm. so I've created a, a compilation of those. This of uh, uh, the mm -hmm. summative evaluation is available now in Novus. It was not provided beforehand because we can't um, my understanding is we cannot because of open meeting law um, and uh, so I'm going to go through what the results were uh, just the number results. I'm not going to read comments. If anyone wanted to read their comments, uh, pull up what you wrote, and uh, I'll call on you. Um, but otherwise, we'll just zip through the, the number part. So the first part of the uh, evaluation talks about assess, we're assessing the progress towards goals. Um, and, oh, and so I also want to say that this is, to me, not the evaluation system I would design mm -hmm. uh, if I was in charge. I think it, personally, I think it does not create the best evaluation. I think we're having conversations with Dr. Holman offline, but this is what the state requires us to do. We must do it. Um, in public session, we can't talk about things beforehand together, uh, mm -hmm. and so I'm, you know, this is, all this pomp is because I'm required to do this by the state, but I just want to make it clear that I personally would not design this system this way. Um, so. First, we assess progress towards goals, um, professional practice goal. Um, which I'm going to find, I'm gonna find the, sorry. Okay, so the professional practice goal um, <coughs> included aligning all priority areas of the strategic, it, it was aligned with all priority areas of the strategic plan uh, and included actions related, included hiring a new deputy superintendent of teaching and learning who could drive the instructional practice of the district forward in alignment with the strategic <coughs> plan, continuing to develop the collaborative and capacity of the cabinet team towards participation in racial equity, professional learning and participation in a deeper learning dozen, continuing to develop relationships with families, town colleagues and community members to share and reinforce the new APS mission and vision statements. So for that, uh, members, one member, uh, marked significant progress, four marked met, and two marked exceeded, and as a group thing, I chose met. The student learning goal is, um, action. It, it's aligned with priority one of the strategic plan, ensuring equity and excellence. Actions related to this goal include continued instructional rounds and professional development for administrators, expanding instructionally focused leadership teams at all schools, focusing on student and staff sense of belonging for all schools, development of strategic plan to model data analysis best practices to be used in development of school improvement plans, and summer for professional learning for principals on developing excellent uh, student school improvement plans. So for this goal, uh, one 
member marked some progress, one marked significant progress, five marked met, and I chose met as the overall uh, mark. And then for the district improvement goals, which I'm not going to read all of them because there's three of them and it will take a long time. Um, so this, this summative evaluation is available for the public in Novus. So six members marked met and one marked exceeded. And again, the, the uh, overall uh, category was met. Step two is assessing performance on standards and standard one is instructional leadership. And for that, six members marked profession and one marked exemplary. Standard two is management and operations. Five marked proficient, two marked exemplary. Standard three, family and community engagement. Six members marked proficient, one marked exemplary. And standard four, professional culture, six members marked proficient, one member marked exemplary, and for all of those four standards I marked um, as a summative thing, I mean as a compilation I marked as proficient. So then the final most important part, which is truly the only thing that we have to turn into the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is the overall summative performance rating. And for that, uh, seven marked the superintendent as proficient, and therefore I marked our overall summative thing as proficient. <coughs> so I'm pleased to pronounce you proficient. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there are many comments which I'm sure the members will be happy to go over. They include both accommodations and a few suggestions for improvement over the next years. Um, but I think the superintendent did a really wonderful job in that she has created a website where she has different presentations which we've seen over the past years and how they're linked to the different goals. Um, and it made it really easy to go back and find things uh, if we didn't remember where we had discussed things. Um, is there anything else I should say about this? Okay. No. Okay. Oh, and I forgot. Does anyone want to read anything from there? Okay. Great. And we are set. Can I just say thank you for the time you put into this? As somebody who does more than a dozen of these, I know how much time it takes, um, and I really appreciate you taking the time to provide comments. I have not read them yet, but I will, um, and I look forward to discussing if there are any questions or elaborations you have on them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And so we have completed, um, I think, does this need to be sent somewhere? I think it needs to be sent to Dessing. Do we need to send? I think Kelly we have to send it. State submission, right. yes. yeah, yeah. it goes in the state submission. It's okay. electronic. Okay. <coughs> oh, okay. Yes. Okay. That's fine. Okay. So <coughs> moving on. We have the superintendent's update. All right. Fantastic. I have a short update just one slide for us today um, because we've been very focused on the move and so that's most of the update. Um, I, we've moved into phase two, Arlington High School and the central offices. I wanna say thank you to the Arlington High School Building Committee, the Arlington School Committee, all of you, um, and the wider Arlington community for their patience. Um, as we have worked through the move, this has been the most complex phase. It was wonderful to have a number of elected officials um, and building committee members and school committee members on tours this past week to see um, the results of so much hard work and many, many hours spent making sure that we could have such a wonderful facility. So we've been very focused on that. Um, as we've experienced tonight, <coughs> we've, of course, got some kinks to work out. There is a punch list that we're working through to make sure that all of our outlets are working, all of our technology is working, all of our lights are working, all of our heat is working. Um, but despite, you know, all of the, you know, pains that come along with a big move, it's gone very smoothly um, and a huge thanks to the moving companies, to Consiglia, our construction company, our architects, um, and Skanska, our folks, um, who have the owner, owner's project managers who have been very responsive to all of the concerns that have come up, and there have been um, a number of things for them to respond to over the last couple of weeks, so we're very grateful. 
We are seeking community members right now for our APS strategic plan working groups. Um, we put the call out earlier this week for folks to join these working groups. We're looking for community members, staff members from all roles across the system. Um, we have students who have signed up. We have more than 40 applicants who have asked if they could be members of a working group, and they've indicated their first and second choices on working groups. So we're looking forward to um, inviting many of those applicants into the working groups starting in January. The meetings for these, if you're interested in them and are watching um, in our public audience, uh, the meetings for these will be on Thursday evenings once a month from 3.30 to 5.30. This is a compensated opportunity. Thank you to the Arlington Education Foundation for making that possible. Um, and our students will be who participate in this will be compensated with um, <coughs> community service hours as well. So we're looking forward to <coughs> expanding those and getting that work started. Uh, I want to say congratulations to the cast and crew of the Arlington High School Fall Play, which was put on ooh, not last weekend, but the weekend before that. Um, their production of Marion or the True Tale of Robin Hood, the teen edition, was spectacular by all counts um, and went smashingly well. We had, because we have a new theater director um, who or manager who maintains the theater space itself and has been doing work directly with the students, this, this was an entirely student-produced play, meaning that our students were the ones behind the scenes doing the set work, doing the light work. They had been taught how to run the theater by our theater manager. So it's been great to have that resource and to be teaching the students not just about um, being the actors on the stage, but also about doing all the background work as well. <coughs> uh, budget development is underway. Mr. Mason and I have begun work on this. We have requests from department heads due tomorrow, and we look forward to updating you in December on what those requests uh, include. And like I noted earlier, your enrollments are included in the buffer zone report. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Anyone? <coughs> okay. No questions. Uh, next, we have the consent agenda. All items listed with an excuse me listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests. In which event, the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 24093, dated 103123, $935,772.28. Warrant number 24114, dated 11723, $252,885.66. And school committee draft minutes of October 26, 2023. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Ms. Gittleson? Oh, yeah, we have to do roll oh, yeah, call. Roll, yeah, roll yeah. call. Okay. <coughs> so, Ms. Gittleson, you have to say yes. You're muted. Or I. You're muted. Or you're muted. Sorry, I thought it's for anyone. Aye. Okay. Mr. Cardin. Aye. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. And I also vote yes. So that's a unanimous vote. Okay. Next we have subcommittee and liaison reports. Uh, budget. Uh, budget met Monday. Um, we did it mostly remote because of the new space. Um, uh, not many new updates on the FY24 budget. Um, Dr. Holman just updated the status of the FY25 budget. <coughs> the schedule finally is in Novus, I think under this agenda item, so everybody has the budget calendar now. Um, we also did an executive session um, to prepare for negotiations, and we'll start having executive sessions here as we enter into negotiations <coughs> with um, first unit D and then first unit A. Community relations. Uh, we met yesterday in an interesting hybrid format in the superintendent's new office. Um, we reviewed the school committee chat schedule and format for this year, um, where administrators are going to be joining, um, and we decided we would continue with that, and we will do, um, or I will do a better job communicating that out um, with the director <coughs> of communications and family engagement. Um, to ensure that the community is aware that they are happening and the administration will be present. Um, and then we had a conversation about um, a collaborative task force between um, some members of various commissions, the Human Rights Commission, the Rainbow Commission, the Disability Commission, um, 
and <coughs> members of the um, APS community to continue to support the district's mission around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And when I have more information about what that will look like and what we as a committee need to do to support that, I will let you all know. Okay, thank you. Uh, curriculum instruction and assessment and accountability. Nothing to report. Okay. Uh, facilities. So we met on uh, November 2nd. Um, we received a report from uh, Mr. Mason uh, that had uh, uh, an inventory of all buses in the district, which we had never received before. It was very helpful. Uh, we received an AHS custodial staffing analysis that compared um, our uh, the, maintenance, the, the maintenance staff and the custodial staff we have in the high school to um, uh, a national standard called the Association of Physical Plan Administrators, and so we're below the standard. <clears throat> we received the APS uh, recreation, uh, uh, um, playground and recreation report. So that was very helpful. So we saw which uh, playgrounds are owned by the, or, or, yeah, owned by the, uh, di the district and which ones are owned by the town. We also, you know, one of the things, this whole thing got kicked off because we wanted a report of which schools can be air conditioned. And uh, Mr. Mason uh, said that just, we need engineers to kind of do that analysis and we'll get that later in the, uh, sometime after the new year. Um, <clears throat> we talked about the accelerated repair program and whether that could be helpful in roof repairs um, that are for, for buildings that are 25 years or older. And then finally, we had a conversation about a potential statement of interest for the Addison Middle School, and I think the group's conclusion was that we will, <clears throat> we request that the superintendent um, look into using uh, an educational consulting firm to figure out um, the, the educational challenges of, the, of that building. What, does, what doesn't work educationally and why? That all align with we're that? We're gonna, yeah, we're gonna go. We're gonna look into what vendors we can use to do yeah, that. Yeah, look into what that. Yeah. So there's a process to get that done. Mm -hmm. And that is pretty much all we talked about. Uh, Mr. Cardin brought something to my attention that we have to talk about. The oh, the um, strategic plan contains facilities elements. Um, now that it's funded, they should start looking at those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it. <clears throat> okay. Policy? No report. High School Building Committee. Dr. Holman gave it. The building's open. Um, <clears throat> and we're very excited uh, that the old building has been cleaned out pretty much and it's going to start to it'll be a process of starting to, is it cleaned out or not yet? <laughs> it's being abated. It's being abated. Mm -hmm. So it's clean. It's cleaned out of stuff. <laughs> so it's very exciting. And if you walk around the building, um, remember that, that hands, the hands, that's now up. What else is up from the old building? Is there something else that's going to go up soon? I would need Mr. McCarthy here. Maybe we need Mr. McCarthy. But anyway, there's some nice there's some nice memories of the old building that are in this new building. But the Fusco entrance has been taken down and yes. is in storage, and they're figuring out does it match what they thought it would look like, or you know the sizing and thickness and stuff. So. And we found a time. Or the, Mr. McCarthy found a time capsule capsule from 1981. Yep. Uh, so when the 1981 edition was done. Uh, there was a time capsule done, and so that's going to be opened at some point in time. I don't know. We're going to coordinate that. And it, it was supposed to be open in 2001. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little bit. It, yeah. So we, who knows what's what survived? Well, it's you know that's right. right. Well, yeah. So anyway. Okay. So the other thing uh, to talk about for the um, new high school is just our room, mm -hmm. and. Mr. Thielman and I have had discussions. We do not remember specific discussions of the furniture or the layout of the working environment here. And uh, I think what I propose is I'd like to talk to Dr. Holman. Uh, I think we want to involve discussions with ACMI. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> but we need to be thinking about what's the most useful arrangement of this room where it can serve appropriately for school committee but can do as much other things as possible mm -hmm. i mean we can tell just from the wires underneath that right now this you know this kind of layout is very hardwired i don't know if this is the only way of doing mics and stuff if it is then that 
dictate some stuff. In the meantime, we're going to work, if you have suggestions for how you think this would be, you know, I've already tweaked it a bit, but if you have other ideas. The yeah, we're, that's, we talked about that. Um, so we'll get a curtain for now, um, so it's more desk-like. But uh, that, I think we should live with the space for a little while before we make decisions. But Dr. Homan and I can can think about it. And yeah, there's a there's a form that goes to everybody uh, in the in the building that, that you can complete with comments or feedback. Or changes right, but this is this is this is ours. We need we need bigger. I mean, we need bigger picture than just their form to think about really how this this space serves mm -hmm. us best. Yep. Right. I mean, and by us, I don't mean just us, but, but serves the school system the best. Mm -hmm. So. You're um, encouraged, okay, we can talk afterwards, but you can sign attachments with that form too. It doesn't have to be, as, you can send a memo and other things. <clears throat> okay. Are the, I have a, a very not important question, but are these Bolton boards, like are we gonna get the art back? Yes. We'll put the, we, yes, we will have art back. Mm. Like the kids, the mm -hmm. students. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I think we have more space. <laughs> we'll be <now>. decorating. <laughs> uh, this room needs I decorating. Really not a priority, yeah. but I we have more wall space. So great. Okay. Um, liaison reports. Announcements. Um, it was good to see uh, Dr. Homan make a presentation at the MAS the MASS joint conference. It was an excellent uh, presentation related to diversity efforts, and I, I would invite her to discuss it a little more than, than I will. But the other thing that happened there is the MASC had their delegate assembly, and our resolution was the first one to be considered, Resolution 1, Full Stable Funding for METCO, and it was approved <coughs> as presented on a vote of 92 to 3 with no abstentions. Good. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, just to join on that, I also was able to attend the MASC conference for the first time, and because mm -hmm. of that, I got a little ribbon, which I don't know if everyone can see, but it says first time attendee, mm -hmm. so I'm special. Um, <laughs> but it was, it is actually a really good use of your time. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't get to see Dr. Holman because I got confused where the rooms were, but I actually ended up in a uh, talk about special education and the new forms and, and the rollout and things, and so that was also really useful and, and interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And there were lots more things that we learned, so. Mm -hmm. uh, next is so that was announcements, future agenda items. I'm starting by saying we are now going to be adding executive session in terms of bargaining to every agenda from now until we say we stop um, because I forgot to add it to this one. Mm -hmm. So we do not have an executive session uh, to discuss things, but we will make sure that there are those added to our future agendas. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any future agenda items? No? <laughs> okay. Um, then at this point, uh, we, I have, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? A roll call. Oh, roll call, you're right. Ms. Gudelson, okay. Yes. Great, Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Thaleman? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. And I also vote yes, and that's an unanimous, mm -hmm. and we are adjourned. So thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.